Good evening, everyone. Once again, welcome. We're so glad that you could join us for our second webinar today, November 30th. Um, we are doing a public education series on aquaculture. Many of you might have joined us back uh, in October for a presentation with Dr. Dale Levitt and Alan DeBonet from Rhode Island Sea Grant. Dale Levitt is with Roger Williams University uh, on um, Aquaculture 101. Today, we are very happy to have uh, Professor David Bankston um, from URI, recently retired, but very glad he uh, is willing and was able and willing to join us and present today on understanding the 5% rule for Rhode Island's coastal salt pots. Just a couple things before we begin, and I turn it over to Dave. All the information uh, from today's webinar and the webinar back in October on Aquaculture 101 is posted on our website. It's www.appliedshellfishfarming.org. And um, if you just go to the Aquaculture Education for the Public link, you'll see a recording from the October webinar. Tonight's webinar will, re will be recorded and posted there, as well as you know, one or two, two page summaries, uh, Word documents for you guys to just download and look uh, that, that tells about what was what was presented during the webinars. So again, tonight we're going to be learning about the history of the 5% rule for the Rhode Island coastal salt ponds. So this is the science, the policy, and the process behind the rule. This isn't a forum to discuss changing this rule. This is purely intended to give you background information on that process that happened and, and of course hear your comments and questions throughout, but that's, that's the uh, purpose of this meeting and we hope you'll join us for a follow-up sum summer uh, public meeting where we can discuss opportunities and challenges more generally uh, around aquaculture in, in our ocean state. So, and just a couple quick things, there's a Q&A box or chat box, um, I believe it will say Q&A off to your, the right hand side of your screen. Please feel free to put any questions you have throughout and we will address these uh, as time allows throughout the presentation. Dave will, will pause at, um, a few, at a few points to address some of those questions and then certainly we'll get to them um, at the end. But please just type those in and, and we'd be very happy to hear from you. So with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce David Bankston uh, for tonight's presentation. Thank you very much, Azure. Um, <clears throat> to all the participants, as you may be able to tell from my voice, I'm recovering from a chest cold, so um, I apologize if I break into a coughing fit here at any point. But I uh, am very happy to have the opportunity to give you some of the history on the 5% rule for coastal pond aquaculture here in Rhode Island. Um, so what is the 5% rule, first of all, in the bit of a technical glitch here. Let me see if I can continue. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, it, and it's also a standard within the aquaculture regulations. Um, the first sentence basically says what I um, just said, total open 5% of the total open water surface area and the limit is established upon the based upon the current knowledge of ecological carrying capacity models that was true at the time it was written it's actually no longer true today and that's something we'll be talking about later um, just to give you a little bit of history the CRMC had convened a, something called the Working Group on Aquaculture Regulations back in 2000. That is convened as needed. It's composed of people from government, academia, the private sector, and nonprofits. Um, and its purpose is for discussion of aquaculture related issues. And one of the things that it can then do is to suggest consensus solutions to problems. As I said, it first met in 2000 because CRMC recognized the need for communication among stakeholders, in uh, particularly in the uh, salt ponds, but in Narragansett Bay as well. And after meeting all the goals for that first um, uh, <clears throat> go round, um, the group stopped meeting in 2002. Uh, but the results of that first effort were a charting project of the various uh, users, particularly 
fishermen, shell fishermen and fin fishermen of Narragansett Bay. Uh, there were new guidelines put into the CRMC regulations and um, there was also increase, uh, clearly increased communication. Pick it up again. When 2007 rolled around, uh, there was an issue that arose because oyster farmers were requesting larger leases. Up till that point, um, they had been requesting two, three, four acres, and then they started requesting 10 acres, 20 acres, etc. So the shellfish harvesters were opposed to uh, the larger leases. Um, the Marine Fisheries Council and DEM both became concerned. And uh, they both actually refused to offer opinions on any new aquaculture lease application uh, until CRMC developed an aquaculture development plan for Rhode Island. Um, of course, the MFC and DEM opinions are necessary for an aquaculture lease application to proceed. Um, I think I'm going to skip the slide there. Hold on. Um, <clears throat> So, sorry. Um, so the approach that CRMC took then was to reconvene the working group to establish some subcommittees uh, on regulations, on biological impacts of aquaculture, and on social impacts of aquaculture. The working group continued to meet on a monthly basis while those subcommittees worked. So who were the members of that working group in 2007? Lots of different kinds of um, interests, lots of stakeholders um, from the non-governmental organizations. There were representatives from Save the Bay, the Salt Pond Coalition, Sierra Club. There were industry representatives from the uh, oyster industry, the, the Rhode Island Farm Bureau, the Ocean State Aquaculture Association. The Rhode Island Shell Fishermen's Association, the Rhode Island Saltwater Anglers Association, and the Marine Fisheries Council. Uh, URI and Roger Williams University were both there representing academia. There were representatives from USDA and state legislators, and very importantly, of course, there were representatives from the regulatory agencies, DEM, Fish and Wildlife, Department of Health, and CRMC. So there was a total of um, 28 members, and about 15 to 20 regularly attended the meetings, uh, which again were monthly. Uh, the room was usually uh, full or close to full, and, and the, the discussions were quite active, and we discussed a lot of this. So <clears throat> I think the reason I'm being asked to present this today is because I was chair of the Biological Impacts Subcommittee. The other members of that committee were Dr. Barry Costa-Pierce, who was heading Rhode Island Sea Grant at that time. Dr. Marta Gomez Chiari from URI, who is a disease and uh, genetics uh, specialist for shellfish and finfish. Um, Dr. Dale Levitt from Roger Williams, who you heard from in the last webinar. Um, Brian Murphy from uh, DEM, who is a fish habitat specialist. Perry Razzo, then representing the Ocean State Aquaculture Association, um, now probably better known as the proprietor of the Matuna Oyster Bar. Dr. Bob Rowe from uh, Spatco Limited at that time, uh, now in a, in a different role in life as the uh, executive director of the East Coast Shellfish Growers Association, and Abby Wood um, from Save the Bay, another fish habitat specialist. So um, we worked diligently during the summer and fall of 2007 uh, and came up with a draft report um, our final report was accepted by the working group on, in January of 2008. And there were chapters on all of the <clears throat> things, that, or the, not all of the things, but the major things that um, we thought might be biological impacts that aquaculture could impose on the salt ponds in Narragansett Bay. These included things like water quality issues, disease considerations, invasive species, physical impacts of aquaculture gear, essential fish habitat, carrying capacity, and an ecosystem approach to marine aquaculture. Now, as the group looked at all of these things, um, they, um, yeah, the, 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 the members of, of the group, as they, as they looked at all of these 
chapters of the report, they decided that the notion of, of, of carrying capacity, aquaculture carrying capacity, is what we really needed to focus on to define the limits of oyster culture in Rhode Island. So what is carrying capacity anyway? Um, for ecologists, um, we use the term carrying capacity basically to define how um, big a population of a particular species can be supported by the resources within an area. That's not um, uh, the definition we're using here. Um, it turns out that aquaculture carrying capacity is a little different, and I'll go through actually four separate definitions of aquaculture carrying capacity that stem from the two references that you see at the bottom of this slide. They're physical carrying capacity, production, ecological, and social carrying capacity. Physical carrying capacity, in my opinion, is a fairly useless concept. Um, it's simply the amount of aquaculture that can physically fit into a body of water. As you see here in China, clearly this is not something we ever want to see in Rhode Island. And so, as I said, it's a fairly useless concept. The production carrying capacity <clears throat> is the maximum aquaculture production that does not have unacceptable impacts on the farm itself. Um, and let me try to emphasize three specific things here. One is it's the maximum aquaculture production. It's not recommended production. This is the upper limit of what could be allowed. Secondly, does not have unacceptable impacts. Anytime you put anything in the water, obviously it's going to have an impact. So we need to decide what's an acceptable impact and what's an unacceptable impact. And then for, for purposes of this definition, the most important part is that this is, these are impacts on the farm itself. And so um, this one really doesn't care about the rest of the environment. It really is just about the production of the aquaculture organisms. Um, it's been widely used in shellfish culture to figure out how much shellfish you can grow in an area before you start to exhaust the phytoplankton supply that's there to feed the oysters, the mussels, the clams, or whatever it is. Ecological carrying capacity uh, looks at impacts on the whole ecosystem. And so it's, the again, the maximum aquaculture production it does not cause unacceptable impacts to the whole ecosystem. And so um, this is a, a slide I'll, I'll show you this again later. Um, and I'm not sure whether you can see the cursor moving on. The, OK, sorry, you can't see the cursor. Um, just notice on the right hand side um, that there is a box called shell, uh, cultured shellfish. And you'll see that there are all kinds of living organisms uh, from around from uh, a marine body of water. Um, that, um, <clears throat> that uh, are, are included as parts of the ecosystem. And so now we're not just concerned about the farm, the, the, the shellfish farm or whatever it is, but now we're concerned about the whole ecosystem. Uh, I may have just, oh, wait, no, sorry, my, my, my bad, my bad. Um, The social carrying capacity is the maximum aquaculture production that does not cause unacceptable impacts to the social system, for example, to fishermen, tourism, etc. And this, of course, is a, an aerial view of Point Judith Pond. Um, and I like this one because it shows a pond where certainly there is oyster aquaculture going on, but there is also a lot of residential property. There's the fishing fleet there in Galilee. There are beaches, tourism, uh, summer visitors, all of that kind of thing. So what is the Rhode Island uh, oyster aquaculture carrying capacity? So going back to that report that I told you about, Dr. Bob Rowe in his chapter of the subcommittee report did a, a back of the envelope calculation of the ecological carrying capacity of Point Judith Pond. So let me just pause and say this is the ecological carrying capacity, not production, not social. Um, it's based on the filtration rates of Point Judith Pond water by the oysters, as well as the estimation of the production and ecological carrying capacity.
capacity for mussels in a New Zealand bay using the EcoPath model. And it was based on a paper that had come out a couple of years earlier before he did this. And let me just explain that EcoPath is um, a, it's freely available ecological modeling software developed originally for fisheries. And um, it's, it's, it's a food web model, basically. So it, it kind of covers the entire, uh, if you remember back to that diagram I showed you of the ecosystem there before with all those boxes and all those kinds of critters in there. It's a, it's a modeling software that um, allows us to look at the um, flow of materials or flow of energy through uh, a system like that. So um, there are some, there are three components, EcoPath, EcoSim, and EcoSpace. EcoPath is the only one we're concerned here. So it's, for those of you who care, it's a static mass balanced snapshot of the system. Um, so um, you probably are aware that uh, oysters filter an awful lot of water. Um, about 13 to 63 gallons per day per gram of tissue dry weight. And um, a market size oyster is about two grams dry weight. And so Dr. Rowe using estimates of oyster sizes and abundances on the lease that Spatco had at that time in Point Judith Pond, he was the major grower in Point Judith Pond at that time, <clears throat> using those numbers above, figured out that um, his oysters uh, filtered, you know, roughly 50 to 200 plus million liters per day. So, um, you know, lots and lots, you know, mil millions of gallons of, of water per day going through his oyster. Um, and given the dimensions of Point Judith Pond, those oysters therefore filtered the entire volume of Point Judith Pond every 55 to 275 days, um, thereby removing phytoplankton from the water. Now, I mentioned this paper about New Zealand carrying capacity. Um, the, the reason I'm mentioning it is it's because it's the only thing that was available at the time. Um, and so these two authors in Tasman Bay, New Zealand, um, use this ecosystem food web model um, to calculate that production carrying capacity for mussels in Tasman Bay was 310 tons per square kilometer per year. And the ecological carrying capacity was 65 tons per square kilometer per year. So um, remember that production carrying capacity is just safeguarding the farm. It just calculates how much uh, muscle production, in that case, you could have and not overtax the phytoplankton supply. supply. The ecological carrying capacity, on the other hand, is um, trying to protect the entire ecosystem. So uh, in other words, um, in, in their specific words, 65 tons per year, or, sorry, 65 tons per square kilometer per year could be harvested without significantly changing the major energy fluxes or structure of the food web in Tasman Bay. Now there are some caveats that we need to apply here clearly. Um, for one thing, Tasman Bay is about the size of the entire state of Rhode Island. Tasman Bay is pretty much oceanic water, so they're likely to be much less productive phytoplankton-wise than the Rhode Island coastal ponds. And these calculations were for mussels, not oysters. But as I said, that was the only thing that we had to go by at that point. So Dr. Rowe, using their numbers, um, Chang and Gibbs work, uh, assumed that 65 tons per square kilometer per year could be harvested from Point Judith Pond without significantly impacting the food web. The area of Point Judith Pond is 1,574 acres, which is 6.37 square kilometers. 65 tons per square kilometer times 6.37 square kilometers is 414 tons per year as a total harvest based on this initial estimate of ecological carrying capacity for Point Judith Pond. So at the 
at the then current stocking density of five tons of oysters per acre, 414 tons divided by five tons per acre means that that production could be done in 82.8 acres. And 82.8 acres divided by 1574 is 5.3%. And that basically is where the 5% rule comes from. Um, now there's much more to the story, so don't turn, tune out at this point, um, but I just wanted you know, to know that's, that's the history of it. So the recommendation <clears throat> by the Biological Subcommittee to the Working Group on Aquaculture Regulations was that we should use 5% as a rough guess at the ecological carrying capacity for oyster aquaculture in Rhode Island, but that we also seek funding to define the actual ecological carrying capacity for Rhode Island waters, um, given those, those caveats that I shared earlier, that, that is the potential large differences between Rhode Island and, and New Zealand ecosystems. And by the way, Point Judith Pond at that time was up, had about 2.4% coverage with oyster culture. So as the various stakeholders in the room talked about this, um, the aquaculture industry said, well, okay, we're at 2.4, we could pretty much double our production before we got up to 5%. And the other people that were less happy about aquaculture being in the pond kind of said, well, you know, 5% is not that much. Um, so uh, we, we think we can, we can live with that. So it became kind of a de facto agreed upon standard, um, again, based at, at the initial rough guess at oyster, uh, sorry, at ecological carrying capacity for oyster aquaculture. So at this point, um, maybe I'll, I'll pause, and uh, there's more to come, but, but I'll pause and see if anyone has any particular questions on the presentation up to this point. So if you do have any questions, you'll see on the right-hand side of your screen, it says Q&A, and there's a couple things in there now. Feel free to type them in um, if something comes up in the next few minutes. Uh, Dave can address it. Um, the, the question is, what, what is the coverage today? And um, I, I'll actually come to that for, for um, all of the uh, coastal ponds at the end of the talk. Uh, as I recall, for Point Judith Pond, it's uh, a little over 3.5%. Um, there's a question about was the year different then? Um, they, I mean, there there have been some changes to the gear. One of the one of the reasons that um, the change was being made from small leases was that at, in the early days was that the oysters were being held in cages or uh, sort of three dimensional gear and the applications for larger leases was because for 10 acres, 20 acres was because um, people were doing um, just, just bottom culture, um, planting oysters on the bottom. Um, and uh, so that requires more, more area. Okay, um, I think I will move ahead then. So um, we, in fact, wrote a proposal to the NOAA uh, Marine Aquaculture Initiative in uh, DC, basically. Um, and we're successful in obtaining a grant to determine carrying capacity for oyster culture in Rhode Island. And <clears throat> I should say this was both for Narragansett Bay and the coastal ponds. Um, so remember the part but in the definitions about with, without causing unacceptable impacts to whatever, the farm, the ecosystem, the social system. A critical question there is who decides what is acceptable or not. I don't know if anybody was thinking about that when I was talking about it, but um, Jang and Gibbs, for example, in New Zealand said, well, we're the modelers, we're going to figure out what's acceptable. Um, and so um, I think so we argued that our stakeholder group, the working group on aquaculture regulations, would be the deciders. And we had a ready-made group. And I frankly think this is 
bigger reason of why we got funded was because we were involving the stakeholders and including them in the process than just doing the um, modeling <clears throat> ourselves. Um, a critical question from a biological perspective is what do you want to protect in the, you know, like the, the farms, the whole eco ecosystem, etc. So if we just want to protect the oyster farms, as I indicated earlier, production carrying capacity is what you try to calculate. Um, but there were other options available, you know, as we met with the stakeholders, um, we kind of didn't really know what to expect. Um, it could be that um, people were just totally fixated on winter flounder populations, and that was all they wanted to protect. Um, maybe people would be interested only in lobster populations. Um, theoretically, you could make the argument that what you really cared about was protecting bacteria. Um, so uh, anyway, there, there, there's a, almost an infinite list of questions about what you want to protect. The working group as a whole at one of its monthly meetings decided that what they wanted to protect was the whole ecosystem. So we then were able to go ahead and use that ecopath ecosystem food web model approach that Jiang and Gibbs had used in New Zealand. The real work of the project was done by Carrie Byron, who was a graduate student at URI at the time. She is now Dr. Carrie Byron, an assistant professor at the University of New England up in Maine. And you'll hear her name again because she continues to work on this. Um, the way the project worked was that we held four meetings over the course of a year with the with the working group stakeholders. Now the, the working group was continuing to meet on a monthly basis, as I recall. Um, and for, during four of those monthly meetings over the course of the year, the particular topic was this carrying capacity modeling. <clears throat> the first meeting was to get feedback from the working group on a draft conceptual model of a coastal pond ecosystem it's basically the one that I showed you earlier in the, that diagram. Um, that uh, conceptual model was developed by um, uh, three, four, five of us sitting around a table, um, and uh, we wanted to get feedback on that. The second meeting was to get feedback on the data sources you, to be used to parameterize the ecopath models. And I should say here that there was one model for Narragansett Bay and then there was another model for a generic coastal pond. So it wasn't specifically Point Judith Pond or Linigrit Pond. It was a generic Southern Rhode Island coastal pond. Um, what do I mean when I say parameterize? That just means uh, plug in the numbers um, that um, will be used. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit uh, in a couple of slides what, what that really means. But um, the, the, the numbers, uh, the, the actual data that go into the model. Um, the third meeting was to get feedback on the parameterized model models themselves, um, that is with all the numbers and, and all, the, all the data input into them. And then the fourth meeting was to present the results of the model outputs. So here's that um, conceptual salt pond ecosystem model that I showed you before. And um, I guess you should notice that the main um, inputs are the sun, sunlight, energy, and nutrients. There is also export or extraction um, from fishing or harvesting aquaculture products or things that you know leave the system. And then again, there are all of these different components of the ecosystem, including things that are in the water and things that are in the sediment down below. We presented this to the stakeholder group, the working group, um, and they uh, came back with a couple of very useful suggestions. One was they said, <clears throat> you forgot the birds. So right up there next to the sun and nutrients, you'll see a box for birds, which we had completely forgotten about. We thank them for including that. And then they wanted us to break out. Um, we had a box called macroalgae and eelgrass, and they wanted us to break them out into two separate um, boxes, given the uh, particularly given the importance of eelgrass in in Rhode Island uh, waters in general. 
Um, notice that this um, box uh, cultured shellfish is there. And um, I guess I should explain at this point that, uh, even though we're just at the conceptual stage here, um, that the way that the, the carry worked with the ecopath model was to um, have this uh, ecosystem parameterized and, and, and modeled and running with no shelf, no cultured shellfish, and then adding increasing amounts of cultured shellfish until the whole system goes out of balance. And so that's the way these ecopath models work, um, is that you try to um, keep, keep the system in balance and, and you investigate the perturbations to the system that throw the system out of balance. So that's basically the way she um, ran these models. Um, there, it turned out there was already a published ecopath model for Narragansett Bay from uh, 10 years or so earlier. And uh, I'm pretty sure you probably can't see this very well, and I didn't intend uh, for you to see it very well. But the idea that I hope you take from it is that there are lots of boxes like you saw in the last diagram with different components of the ecosystem in there. But this time there are that you'll see that there are actual numbers in the boxes. And then there are also arrows between the boxes indicating transfer of matter or transfer of energy between boxes. And um, so the numbers in the, in the boxes are just uh, the biomass of how much of that particular critter or group of critters there is expressed as milligrams of carbon per square meter in um, Narragansett Bay in this case. Um, and then the arrows have uh, also numbers associated with them, which again talk about transfer of uh, material from uh, one box to another. And it's expressed in terms of milligrams of carbon per meter squared per year. So it's a rate function. Uh, this is a, um, a little bit more blown up view of that box. And again, I just want to point out that um, Carrie included um, a new box called Cultured Oysters. Um, and uh, it's not really supposed to be. Um, uh, realistic in this particular version of the model, but just to give you the idea that that um, there are, uh, cultured oysters being added to the model, and once again, she just increased the amount of oysters that were being cultured until the system went out of balance. So where did all these data come from to parameterize the model? So we needed information on the abundances of organisms in all those compartments. Um, how much uh, they ate, who they ate, all that kind of thing, as you could probably gather from the previous diagram. So Carrie searched through published literature on Rhode Island waters, uh, which there's an incredible amount since the oceanography school has been there. And prior to that, the Narragansett Marine Lab had been there for decades and decades. Um, she also searched through master's theses and PhD dissertations at local universities. Um, EEM came forward with a lot of information that they had in their files. It wasn't necessarily published or generally available. Um, and then if there were there, if there was information that we needed that um, just wasn't available specifically for Rhode Island waters, uh, <clears throat> she also obtained data from uh, similar systems nearby like Connecticut or New York or Mass, you know, Southern Massachusetts, something like that, um, to, to put into the models. So where we ended up, or where she ended up, was with calculations of ecological and production carrying capacity in Rhode Island. So um, let me point out uh, a number of things that helps get us oriented to this graph, first of all. Um, there are three conditions or three areas. One is the New Zealand results that I've already told you about. The second one is the Rhode Island pond model. And the third one is Narragansett Bay. On the left hand, and on the y axis, the left axis there, you'll see that the data are presented on a log scale and the data are in metric tons, tons of aquaculture production per 
square kilometer, it's actually per year. Um, and the, uh, the blue bar indicates the current condition at the time that this was done, which was around 2009, 2010 when she finished. Um, the reddish bar is the ecological carrying capacity and the green bar is the production carrying capacity. So given the, what we know from the New Zealand study, let me start there by just illustrating that um, the ecological carrying capacity, I'm sure you'll remember in New Zealand was 65 tons uh, per year, per square kilometer per year. Um, and the production carrying capacity was 310 tons per square kilometer per year. So even though those bars don't look all that different, um, because this is on a lot of scale there, the, the, again, the red bar is 65, the green bar is 310. Now, when we move to the Rhode Island ponds, um, the current production levels um, are around 12 tons per square kilometer. It turns out that the ecological carrying capacity was was huge. It was getting up close to a thousand tons per square kilometer. Actually, it's 770 something. We'll see it in I think the next slide. And the production carrying capacity is even over a thousand tons. Now, why is that? That's just because the um, the, the waters of the Rhode Island ponds are so productive because there's so much nutrient input going into them. Narragansett Bay, you can see the current condition in blue is, is way below one ton per square kilometer. The ecological carrying capacity is not as high as the coastal ponds, but the production carrying capacity overall is um, uh, even higher, and that I think is largely because of the amount of flushing that goes on in Narragansett Bay. So here are the actual numbers, and um, just to kind of flesh out what I was just telling you, um, the area of Tasman Bay, again, is 4,500 square kilometers. Like I said, it's pretty much the size of the entire state of Rhode Island. Rhode Island coastal ponds have a area of about 22 square kilometers, and Narragansett Bay is 355 square kilometers. So um, again, in uh, New Zealand, Jang and Gibbs calculated that the ecological carrying capacity was 65 tons per year. Um, carry, based on the Ecopath model, calculated that the ecological carrying capacity is 722 tons per square kilometer per year. And um, for Narragansett Bay, it's almost 300 tons per square kilometer per year. Um, if you figure that out using the kind of way that we did before in terms of percent of area, that meant that that would mean that um, 47, four, sorry, 46 percent of the surface area of the coastal ponds um, could be devoted to oyster aquaculture without. Um, substantially or significantly disrupting the ecosystem. Uh, again, that's largely because of the amount of nutrient productivity. Narragansett Bay is uh, considerably lower. It's about 9%. So the re well, you can imagine what the response of the stakeholders was to that. First of all, they thanked Carrie for her work. Um, they understood the process because they had been part of it and had been um, brought through the entire modeling process. They accepted the numbers as biologically valid, but 46% of the area of the coastal ponds devoted to oyster aquaculture, even though it's biologically acceptable, is not socially acceptable. And I think the specific quote that I remember from the meeting where this was presented um, was something like, boy, that 5% number looks pretty good. And um, so the group decided to accept 5% of the pond area as the socially acceptable number. Now, I re I'm calling it here social carrying capacity. That's not probably not technically true, but it's kind of a de facto social carrying capacity compromise that the group um, achieved at that point. 
<clears throat> so what's the current status? Um, people are trying to figure out how how to model the social carrying capacity, including Carrie and Dr. Tracy Dalton at URI. And by the way, I should point out that um, around the same time that Carrie was working, possibly a little bit later, I'm not quite sure, um, a graduate student in Marine Affairs, Kira Dakene, uh, did a master's thesis there um, at trying to figure out some measure of social carrying capacity based on surveys that she had done of um, Rhode Islanders. Um, Anyway, the 5% the rule now exists as a socially based number. So I would say it's no longer the best available biologically based number, um, but it's kind of a socially based number at this point. And I should, I should point out also that Dr. Byron and Dr. Dalton and Dr. G, from, um, who's an economist from Woods Hole, published a paper in 2015 um, where they're starting to look at integrating the um, ecological uh, and economic models for trying to figure out um, social carrying capacity. Um, probably critical to point out that there is no plan to change the 5% rule uh, at this point. And of course, 5% means that 95% is still available for everything else. Um, someone was asking earlier what the coverage is today uh, based on the CRMC 2015 aquaculture report. Here are the different water body, the salt, different salt ponds uh, along the south coast, the area uh, of each pond in acres, the number of acres in aquaculture as recorded in that 2015 report, and a calculation of the percent area in aquaculture. So you can see that point due to Pond is still the, the leader with 3.6%, Minigrit a ways behind at 2.5%, Potter's Pond at 2.1%, and so forth. So um, the good news is that there is, just as in 2008 or 9 or 10, um, the, you know, there's room for expansion of aquaculture. Um, and uh, so the, the, I think the aquaculture industry still has some things to look to look forward to in terms of expanding, um, and people still seem to be um, not too disconcerted by the fact that um, you know aquaculture is is growing but is not taking over the ponds, um, which I guess is what I'm saying here. So there's room for aquaculture expansion before we get there, um, and that that five percent figure is, is now based on a de facto social carrying capacity, not the biologically determined ecological carrying capacity. Um, I should also say that um, there are a couple of other projects going on that are not really related to social carrying capacity, but uh, Rhode Island Sea Grant has supported projects by um, Dr. Uh, Wally Fulweiler from Boston University, um, first in the 2014 to 16 funding cycle on um, the sediment dynamics essentially under the aquaculture farms, trying to help out the aquaculture farmers um, figure out how to best configure their cages, but, but also obviously um, probably uh, helping to identify or, or update the ecological carrying capacity. And in the 2016 to 2018 funding cycle, she also has um, funding to um, uh, figure out what is the the new ecological carrying capacity for Narragansett Bay, given the reduced amounts of nutrients going into Narragansett Bay um, uh, due to the cleaning up of Fields Point and all of that kind of thing. So I think I will stop there. Thank you for your attention and ask if you have any questions. Thank you, Dave, very much. That was great information and I think there's a few questions coming in so Dave will just address those as they come up. Can you see that? I, 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 I can see. I, I, yep. I, my understanding is that um, people who are asking questions don't have their names exposed to the entire um, group. Um, okay. Um, so the one, one participant says, thanks for, for mentioning her name. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, so there's, uh, there's certainly uh, 
certainly lots of exciting work still going on and, and this is a um, you know it, it was it, just to kind of run back through it was in, in, in 2007 Dr. Rowe came up with the best available calculation that he could make at that time that was very helpful um, Carrie did a tremendous amount of work on coming up with the ecological carrying capacity I think that's also helpful and um, um, Byron and Dalton and Fulweiler and probably others will be uh, contributing to the, um, the refinement of this whole idea of carrying capacity in the future. Just to add, we do have on that AppliedShellfishFarming.org website a whole list of already started some links of many of the things Dr. Bankston mentioned tonight and we'll add, add, add a few other things. Um, particularly that, that recent aquaculture journal article by Dr. Dalton at all. So we'll, we'll continue to add some resources that he referenced here in tonight's presentation for you up on that website. So please be sure to check there for that, a recording of the webinar, and then a, a written summary of the webinar. Lots of things for you to, to learn. Um, so uh, the question is, what are the largest social issues? Are some leases being opposed for their looks? Um, yeah, I'm sure some are still being opposed for their looks. Uh, in fact, that that might be a, a, the, the largest social issue. Um, the the, the I, I think you know one one large issue continues to be use of uh, common. Um, areas of, of, of the water and, and, and <clears throat> I can I mean I can recall when we were going through this process the Ro members of the Rhode Island Shell Fishermen's Association talked about how um, and that's certainly true that, that there are sets of clams in an area and then they kind of get harvested out and then there might not be sets of clams there for quite a long time and then there will be another set so even though they're not working a particular area um, and, and of course the, the uh, standard in, in uh, Rhode Island for uh, allowing a lease is that the um, quad uh, population not be more than uh, one per meter squared. So uh, the, uh, you know, even, even though a, an area is not particularly workable um, by, by a bull raker for, um, uh, you know, for, for, for the moment, uh, they, they wanted to kind of preserve that that area for, for future use. So so those those are those are some social issues. Clearly, um, you know, there's there's going to be um, potential interactions with um, recreational fishing um, or uh, just tourism in general. On the other hand, um, there are areas of the world where aquaculture tourism is a is a is a, is a tourist touristic activity. In other words, you can, you know, people people will pay as as Perry Ronzo has demonstrated. I mean he has he takes tours out to his his site to uh, show folks what, what oyster aquaculture looks like. And so it, it's I think it's a you know kind of a two edged sword. Um, and I see a comment here that industry is is trying to ensure the growers use best management practices. I, sh I should have said that both the um, the Pacific Coast shellfish growers and the East Coast shellfish growers have developed best management practices for their members um, to, you know, help them to um, fit in 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 their environment and and create indus an industry that is both socially acceptable to the other people in around them, um, but also to improve their own. Productivity and, and, and profits in the end. Could there be an issue with leasing and public access? Yeah, that's certainly a um, uh, question for CRMC. It's it's unfortunate that um, uh, Dave Butel uh, from CRMC is is not here today. He's actually traveling to uh, to be with uh, family. Um, but uh, 
Yeah, of course, with any new lease or lease expansion application, there is a, a process that, that one goes through. And um, um, so uh, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a whole, you know, public hearing process and everything that, that um, uh, by which the public obviously can um, uh, be, be involved in, in helping the CRMC, the council, come to a decision. Um, is, is there an interest in hard clam culture? Um, yeah, there are a few people growing hard clams. It's not, it's a very, very minor part of the industry at this point. Um, so I wouldn't say that oysters are the sole focus, but they're probably 98 to 99% of the focus. Do I see the potential for land-based aquaculture in Rhode Island? Um, it, it's, if you mean shellfish culture, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's probably not. Um, if you mean um, finfish culture, potentially, but there the question is really one of economics largely um, utilities, uh, because of high utilities costs, high labor costs, high land costs, high everything costs here in Rhode Island. So um, land-based aquaculture could potentially be done for, um, again, not for shellfish, but for um, maybe some specialty kinds of thin fish, uh, certainly ornamental fish, something like that, but you may not consider that aquaculture. Um, uh, or, 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 you know, highly, highly prized species that one might sell, you know, directly sell to a, to a restaurant or something like that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I, I keep forgetting about kelp because I'm a I'm an animal person. But um, uh, yeah, there is there is potential for growing um, <clears throat> uh, marine uh, macroalgae and things like that um, here um, in particular. Sorry, I, there's more questions coming in. Um, So although there's more available capacity, is it becoming more difficult to locate productive? Um, and I'm, this is ah, uh, yeah, probably. Um, the um, um, there's, I, I mean, I've been hearing about uh, issues in. Um, Minigrid Pond, for example, where shellfish farms are sort of um, have been kind of packing, I don't want to say packing in close together, but perhaps being too close to each other for um, optimal usage of the phytoplankton productivity that's in the pond there. So, yeah, it's, it's probably going to become uh, a little more difficult to um, find, you know, productive sites that are acceptable to the public. And yes, there are, there is growing interest in um, scallop culture. Um, I believe Perry Razzo is, has been, I know, I know he's been raising some of them. And I know I've um, had some of the first harvest at his restaurant. I'm not sure if he's, he's probably not harvesting enough yet to make that a regular option. But um, yeah, there certainly are some challenges with scallops. Great. Well, thank Dave once again for presenting tonight and for all your great questions. Um, please, again, join us this summer for uh, a meeting we will have. 
uh, where we can talk a bit more broadly on this topic and others relating to opportunities and challenges that you all see uh, in aquaculture in Rhode Island's future. So that's something to look forward to. And all that information will be on the AppliedShellfishFarming.org website. Um, and once again, thank you very much for your time and for joining us tonight. Thank you.